to meet my husband, but I can't find him. Do you think that you could help me? being cooped up on the train for so long, right, Squirt? Whatever you say, Grandpa. <sighs> I didn't know they even made buildings like this. Yep. We're in the big time now. Okay. We've rested enough. Let's go. Come on. Mr. Cobb! Hello! Mr. Cobb! Oh, thank goodness. Yes, for heaven's sake, put those down. Mr. Cobb, welcome to Baltimore. Load these up, please. You look fine, just fine. I'm Stoddard Bell. Oh, Judge Bell, this is my daughter-in-law, Billy Cobb. I certainly heard a lot about you. It's nice to meet you. Wonderful to meet you. And my granddaughter, Nancy. How do you do, sir? How do you do? <laughs> well, I think we're all set. I'm going to have the baggage sent out later, so just follow me. Is this your first train ride, young lady? No, sir, but it's the first time I ever slept on a train. Did you sleep well? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember me? My name was probably Mud in your household three years ago. I didn't hear that. <laughs> I like a tactful child. Well, Sweet Pea, I put your grandfather through H.E. double toothpicks. But in case he was too modest to say so, he put on one of the finest defenses I ever witnessed on the bench. And that's why you got to take the train ride all the way to Baltimore. You know what a federal district judge is? Sort of. That's what I trade on now in private practice, Mrs. Cobb. Let's say a businessman has a problem with some federal agency. He retains me. Of course, for bread and butter law business, I hire go-getters like your grandpa. <laughs> Feast your eyes. Built in 1895. Solid as a rock. I'll give you the grand tour. By the way, that uh, car there is yours. It looks like a new car, Judge. You said you were going to arrange for me to buy a used one. I can't afford that. You aren't affording it. I am. You mean you're lending it to me? No, I'm giving it to you. Oh, no. I can't let you give me a car, Judge. Sorry. Drive it or walk. It's up to you. Stuff in here came out of my attic. My mother bought it new. When your furniture arrives, you can decide whether to keep mine or use your own. Won't matter to me. I personally went around with a plumber. He said you'll have plenty of hot water as long as you don't get carried away taking baths. <laughs> Fine place for a law library. Hmm. My library would fill about one half of one of these shelves. You'll build it up. Mrs. Cobb, my mouth just waters to think of the meals that ladies before you must have prepared on this fine old range. Nancy, I bet you've never used a real icebox. Well, in Baltimore, we still have ice delivery once a day, rain or shine. What do you think? Oh, I hardly know what to say. <laughs> I've got a little surprise for you, then I'll get out of your hair. I had my cook make your dinner. Just warm it up in the oven. Well, goodbye. 
Cobb, I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early. Oh, oh well, uh, thank you for everything, Judge. Oh, you're welcome, Judge. You didn't tell me what the rent was here. Or did you buy me the house, too? Matter of fact, I did. gone for over a third of my whole life. You still miss him, don't you? Every day. I hope we don't have ghosts. <laughs> I doubt it. If we did, the judge would have mentioned it as one of the selling points of the house. <laughs> Go to sleep, Reggie. Morning, Judge. How come the sign says Bell and Cobb down there? I had to make it that way. But what about the other partners, the go-getters? Doggone it, I never saw a man complain so much because the job turned out better than he thought it was going to be. Here's my last word on the subject. Take it or leave it. Can I sit down? Why don't you sit down? Oh, remember I was going to get you waved into the Maryland bar? Well, they agreed as a courtesy to me. Just keep in mind, we're a common law state, and you'll do fine. Common law, historical stuff. Don't worry about it. The kind of cases we'll be handling, you already know what you need to know. Now, let's go. We're due in court. The matter before this court is a petition by the Morgan Sugar Beet Farms for a production exemption from the Office of Price Administration. Who's representing the OPA? I am, Your Honor. Your Honor, good it morning, is the OPA. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. This is my associate, Armand Cobb. Your Honor. Nice to meet you, Mr. Cobb. Your Honor, it is the OPA's position that the line must be held on production quotas, or the well-controlled market they have worked so diligently to establish will disintegrate into chaos. Mm, you have many more of this rhetoric? Well, yes, sir, I do. And the next time you give me a brief, try to remember why it's called a brief. Why don't you take Judge Bell's brief home and study it? It's a model of succinct writing. You want to make a statement, Judge? Yes, Your Honor. My client's paltry few hundred tons of beets won't have any effect whatsoever on inflation. If the OPA is in the business of bankrupting small farmers, it ought to be abolished. Make the motion. Get up and move the petition be granted. Move the petition be granted, Your Honor. So rude. See there, you just made the firm $5,000.
watch television. Can I go? Sure, honey, but don't be late. I saw it before, Grandpa. It's like the radio, only there were people on this little round screen. This man called Brent Gentz was talking about President Truman. He's dreamy. President Truman? No, Brent Gentz. Oh, it doesn't sound as interesting as Amos and Andy. It's not interesting at all. But you can see stuff. It's wonderful. You don't mind buying groceries with stolen money, do you? Stop that. It's the truth. The judge hasn't given me a single case of my own ever since I got here. Nobody even comes into the office except these fat cats who hire him to wangle deals from the government. We could go back home. I've been thinking about that. You know, Billy, for the first time in my life, I'm making $10,000 a year. And I'll tell you something, as lackluster as my practice might have been, I didn't feel like a failure. But I sure do now. Poor Dad. I think part of your problem is you're lonesome. You miss all your old cronies. All you have now is me to laugh at your jokes. And you've heard all of them. I think I'll take a little walk. I'll see you later, okay, Billy? Okay, Bob. Guy, Here's one. A fellow walks into a psychiatrist's office and he's got a parrot on his head. The psychiatrist says, What's the problem, sir? And the parent says, I don't know, Doc, but I got this guy hanging under my feet. Didn't tell it right. What do you do for a living, sir? I'm an iron worker. What do you do? Lawyer, attorney at law. Did you hear the one about the lawyer who goes into the aquarium and, uh... Okay. Keep the change. $12. Here, take no, it. No, I wasn't going to rob you. I don't want your money. All I want to do is talk to you. Well, that's a pleasant change. <laughs> Look, I heard you say that you were a lawyer. Most lawyers only give a damn about rich people. But you seem like you're different from them somehow. Yeah? I don't know. I want to hire you. I don't have much money, but I got a hell of a problem. You sound like my type of client. <laughs> Harmon Cobb. Hi, I'm Michael Stainback. You got some time right now? Sure, come on. What, uh, what uh, can I do for you? Well, I want you to get a friend of mine out of a state mental hospital. America Populist is her name. Her and I are engaged. She came to Baltimore ten years ago from Greece to marry some guy. It was all arranged. She was only 17. A month later, she was a widow. She worked, she used to work in this Greek restaurant that friends of mine own, Nick and Melina Vovokis. They're like family to the both of us, you know? Anyway, a couple of months ago, America started having these ups and downs. One day she'd be okay, and the next she'd have the blues, crying her heart out. Her doctor told her that she was depressed and that there wasn't anything he could do for her, but maybe a psychiatrist could help. He gave her the name of some guy downtown. His name was Oberlin. She tried to see him, but they told her that he got 20 bucks an hour and that she'd have to pay before every session twice a week. Can you believe it? But then they tell her that there's a way that she can get free help from Dr. Oblin. What she'd have to do is sign herself in to the state mental hospital that he works at some of the time. 
she was real happy, thinking that maybe she might be cured. The next day, she made me take her out there. She wouldn't even let me go inside with her. She just got out of the car with her little suitcase and went in four months and four days ago. Are you telling me that she committed herself to a, uh, an insane asylum? Yes. Do you visit her? Once. She had lost weight. She had scratches on her arms. They wouldn't let us be alone. She said, Michael, I made a terrible mistake. I'm going to go crazy. Please get me out of here. The next visiting day, they said that she was too sick for me to see her unless I was a relative. Well, what is it you think I can do for you? If America's crazy, they made her crazy. Why would they do that? I don't know. I just want you to get her out of there, please. Well, if she's in as bad a shape as you say, uh, then even if you could get her out, what would you do if you did? I don't know. All I know is that she's in there alone. Yeah. Please. Well, uh, guess I can ask some questions. What am I talking about? I'm new in this town. I don't even know what the law is here. You need a better lawyer than I am. No, you can do this. I have a feeling about you. I want you. Please. Okay, but I can't promise you anything. Good night. All right. Thanks a million. I, uh... That was television. Actually, Dolores and I went up to her room and listened to Inner Sanctum instead. I don't blame her. I have a little news. Mm hmm? I've decided to get a job. That's great. Doing what? Well, I do have a bachelor's degree. There's got to be some company out there who wants somebody smart. Yeah, but what are you going to do? Your degree's in music. How should I know? Why aren't you jumping up and down and saying, go get him, Billy? I am. I'm jumping up and down on the inside. <laughs> Thank you. Tell this fellow you ain't interested. Our firm doesn't do that kind of work. Well, I didn't say I was going to take the case. I just said I'd ask some questions. So how does one go about getting a person out of a mental institution in this state? Well, I guess you could always prove they were sane. What else? Okay, you can solve this the way a lot of other things in this life get solved, with money. If somebody will pay for her care, you can petition the court to move her to a private facility. Either way, the firm of Bell and Cobb ain't interested. Cobb? Michael. Thanks for coming. Welcome to Nikos. I'm Nick Bobakas. Anything you need, you got. Thank you. You tell him what I tell you, huh? Nick's a great guy. <laughs> Melina, that's his wife. Michael, you're not going to like what I have to tell you. What do you mean? I mean, there are two ways to get your friend out. One, prove that she's cured. Two, find another place for her to go and have a few thousand dollars so she can stay there. We don't have that kind of money. I know that. Looks like we're out of luck. What is this you say? That they can take a nice person and ruin her? No, sir, that is not right. This is America. I know it's not right, but it's the law. I, I, I don't know what to do about Will it. Will you change the law? I can't change the law. Well, thank you anyway, Mr. Cobb. I really appreciate it. Wait, wait a minute, wait. Melina, go get the picture of Marika at the picnic. Go. Listen, mister. Marika Popolos was nobody important. She is just a poor immigrant who works in a restaurant. But to Melina and me, she's like our own daughter. Here. You see this picture? 
That's who she was. She was like sunshine coming into her room. Mister, did you ever lose somebody you love? And it's something where, how you say, if he was there, maybe you could save him. But somehow you could not be there. And you feel so bad, you just want to die. Do you know what I'm talking? My son was killed in the war. Then you know. You keep this picture, mister. You look at Marika. You will think of something. Please. Well? Well what? What do you mean, well what? Ask me. Ask you what? She got the job, Grandpa. Ah, so. Mm, I got the job. Mr. Mark said, what retail experience have you had? I said, none. So he said, well, what other jobs have you held? I said, wife and mother. So he said, why should I hire a person with no experience? This is the good part. So I looked him right in the eye and I said, Mr. March, I have a degree in music, so I will certainly be knowledgeable about records and sheet music, both classical and popular. I have excellent penmanship, so I'll be able to write legible sales slips. I'm certain I can learn to use a cash register in less than five minutes. And as for my lack of retail experience, I happen to have one hell of a great personality. Yay, Mom! <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Judge. I've decided to represent Marika Popolis. Who? The girl, you know, the Greek girl. You know, the one in the mental place. That makes me damn mad. Do you know a good psychiatrist, one with a reputable clinic that the state would approve? All right, supposing I do let you take the case. Is the woman sane? Apparently not. Okay, did you find someone who's able and willing to pay for her care? No. Then how the hell are you going to get her out, you jackass? Well, I'm pay for it myself. I'll mortgage the house you gave me, and I'll sell the car you gave me. My God, no wonder you were the poorest lawyer in the state of Colorado. All right. I know blackmail when I see it. I'll do it. What are you talking about? Do what? Pay for the woman's treatment. I don't want you to pay for it. Stay out of it, Judge. I'm paying, and that's that. I'll put $5,000 into escrow to guarantee six months' treatment. That'll satisfy the court. Maybe she can be cured in that length of time. Maybe she can't. That's as far as I'll go. There's a psychiatrist I know, Alan Friedman. Good man. Lizzie's got his number. Nope. I better call him. There's no reason why he should give you the time of day. Oh, and get yourself appointed as this woman's legal guardian. That way they'll have to let you see her and represent her. Ah. I'll take care of that, too. Thank you, Judge. Don't thank me. I'm just protecting my money. After you take care of this, maybe then you can get down to business. What business? You don't give me any business. And that's another thing. I just gave you another gift horse. Quit looking him in the mouth. America Kupoulos. I'm her lawyer. One Thank you. Come in. Well, all that has to be concluded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Dr. Holloway. What's this about? How do you do, sir? Harmon Cobb. I'm an attorney with the firm of Bell & Cobb. Stoddard Bell? That's right. I'm about to petition the county court to have a patient of yours named Marika Pupulis released into private care. This is Dr. Friedman. possibility this patient can leave the premises. I'm sorry. 
Well, I'm sorry, doctor, but you see, my firm has been retained by her legal guardian, and uh, we would like to do an examination right here now. Who's her legal guardian? Me. What do you think, Doc? Would you take her into your clinic? Sure. If they let her out. Why wouldn't they? Ever hear of a place called Bedlam? I've heard the word. It was a lunatic asylum in London in the 17th century. They put people in there who were deformed, epileptic, retarded, people like cleft palates, brain tumors, you name it. It was a human garbage dump. 300 years ago, the English had an excuse. They didn't know any better. Come on, Doctor. This is the United States of America, 1947. What I'm saying is, the girl was probably mistreated, but that's my opinion. It wouldn't stand up in court. But I'll tell you something else. She has been mistreated. It sure as hell won't be in their interest to have her recover. Why not? Recovered people talk. Aren't you being overly dramatic? I hope you're right. Jazz section? Oh, sure. Come here. I'll show you. Hey, I don't know if I can afford a new record. I was just going to come in and browse around until I saw you. Oh, Jimmy Lunsford. He's great. This is a new one. Could I listen to it? I mean, sure. I, yeah, I mean, I might, might even buy it. I'll just have to pay day. <laughs> okay, so here's all you need to know about me. My name is Jack Atkins, and I teach high school math. And I always compliment the cook whenever I'm invited over for dinner. And my only... Physical infirmity is pretty lousy eyesight. I've never been married, and I've never even, you know, up until now, been in love. So, how about you? <laughs> Gee, I don't know what to say. <laughs> oh, my gosh, now I've done it, haven't I? Um, see, I'm so shy, I usually don't even open my mouth around women. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm sorry. So inasmuch, Your Honor, as my client has been accepted for treatment at the Freedman Psychiatric Clinic, and inasmuch as $5,000 has been placed into escrow for her continuing care, Marika Pupulis requests that her petition for release be granted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Mr. Daly? Your Honor, we'd like to call Dr. Boone Halloway. That Harmon Cobb, God sent him to us. <laughs> this is only a hearing, Doctor. You don't have to be sworn. Thank you. I'm here today to recommend that this court not grant Merica Papoulos' petition. This patient is psychotically depressed. She's paranoid with severe suicidal tendencies. And this has occurred despite heroic efforts to save her. Since committing herself to our care, this patient has undergone 12 insulin coma treatments and eight electroconvulsive shock treatments, the latest one yesterday morning. Your Honor, I strongly believe the trauma to Merica Papoulos of changing her surroundings and her physician would result in her death. No! no that is no, right! Nothing no, wrong with no, that! No! 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 No
If you like Terrapin, I made a reservation at Pirandell's Fish House for every night for the next two weeks, just in case. <laughs> Are you asking me out to dinner? Oh, boy, see, I ought to read a book on how to talk to women. I'm sorry about it. Wait a minute. Gosh, don't take no for an answer till I say it, will you? Well, aren't you going to say no? I don't know. No. <laughs> No, wait, no. Do you, but do you mean no, you aren't going to say no, or no, you're, you don't want to go out to dinner with me? Before you figure that out, how about Thursday? <laughs> Look, I think you should know I'm a widow and I have a child. How old? Boy or girl? A girl. She's 12. Okay, so I'll pick you up at 6.30. Where do you live? Well, you're asking for it. 616 Laurel Street. The house doesn't have any closets. You can't miss it. Come in. Hi. Just came in to say good night. Hmm. What a pretty woman. Who is she? Oh, she's uh, involved in the case I'm working on. Did I wake you up tramping around? No, I wasn't asleep. Dad, how would you feel if I met another man I like someday? Not that I necessarily have. But would your feelings be hurt? I mean, I've always been Harry's wife to you. Billy, you're a grown woman. You can do anything you want. I'll get that. Hello? Yeah, this is Friedman. Do you remember Holloway saying that they'd given Marika Papoulos a shock treatment yesterday morning? That would have been shortly before I examined her. Yes? Well, there's certain residual effects that linger long enough for me to have noticed them. Are you telling me that Holloway lied? That's right. Well, if you think that, do you think he lied about the other treatment? I couldn't prove it. Listen, Cobb. Holloway practiced psychiatry for 10 minutes. Then he became an administrator. All he cares about is feeding his patients on 49 cents a day and looking good for the legislature. You want to know about Overland? He gets a flat fee for every patient he refers out there, whether he commits them or they commit themselves. Then he gets a fee for treating them, which maybe he earns, maybe he doesn't. In my opinion, he's just a, a, a wholesale supplier. I'd love to nail both those butchers. Hello? Hello? Everything all right? Yes. Okay. Good night. Night. Cobb, I'd like to see Dr. Halloway. Oh, he isn't here. Oh. Okay, if I wait? You know, you could have saved yourself a lot of trouble with a phone call. You won't be in today at all. Hmm. Thank you very much. Friend. I'm Donald. America's my friend. What are you, Norway? Yes. We have to go through another room. Well, don't worry. 
Nobody will hurt you. I have to meet my husband. Who is it's very important. I'm very interested. You're hurting me. Those are the bad ladies. They can hurt you. Sometimes they put Marika in there, and she gets into fights. Do the doctors do anything for her? No. They used to keep cold here. Now it's where my friends live. Should have locked you in there and thrown away the key. Marika Pupoulos is my client. I don't care if she's your mother. You are a member of this law firm. Judge, don't you even care that they've got people locked up like animals down there? Don't you accuse me of being heartless. I know that what they did to Marika Pupoulos down there in that hellhole drove her crazy. I don't know why they did it. Maybe they thought it was a prison or a torture chamber instead of a hospital. Maybe they were saving money. I don't know. But they're not going to get away with it. I'm going to sue to have Marika Pupulis put in a private hospital at their expense. And I'm going to sue them for damages. You horse's ass. Don't you know we have in this state a thing called sovereign immunity? In English common law, it means that the king can do what he damn well pleases. What it means to you is you can't sue the state. Look at you. You're the most pitiful excuse for an attorney I've ever seen. You are the most contrary human being I've ever met in my life. First, you tell me I'm such a good lawyer, you want to hire me. Then you get me here, and you don't give me any cases. And now you're calling me pitiful. Well, if I'm so pitiful, what the hell did you hire me for? I hired you because I was the instrument of your destruction. I made you defend that German POW. It ruined your life. I couldn't die knowing I had done that to a man, so I made myself the instrument of your resurrection. You didn't ruin my life. Yes, I did. The town turned against you. They did not turn against me. We found the real murderers. That's beside the point. On account of me, you lost your practice. I never had any practice. I wasn't ambitious enough to have a practice. What are you telling me? That you made me a charity case so that you could feel noble? Write out your resignation. Why should I? Fire me. I will not be the instrument of your destruction a second time. Damn you, just quit. Judge, you are a piece of work. I will not quit. I'm going to live in your house and I'm going to drive your car. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to sue the state of Maryland. You're all so in love with somber beauty of ancient precedent, fine. But there is a way around sovereign immunity, and I'm going to find it. Just because it's never been found before doesn't mean it can't be done. I'm going to find it, and I'm going to save America Pupulis, and I'm going to show you that it can be done, you sanctimonious old goat. <laughs> That's more like it. Hi, I'm home. Hey, Dad. Anything interesting? Scintillating stuff. The common law of England. I'm up to King George the Third. 
You want to borrow it after I'm through? No, thanks. I've actually got a date tonight. He's coming to me in 20 minutes. i got to get a move on. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll get it. I wonder if your father-in-law is still in the cellar. I'd sure like to meet him. I think you better leave him to me. Did you have a good time at all? Yes, I did. I might even want to do it again sometime. You would? Yes. Okie doke. <laughs> uh, Billy, I'm ridiculously impulsive, and I always have been. So here goes. I'm just crazy about you. I decided that the great love of my life was just never going to be in the same place as I was. And, 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 and now, here, here you are, after all, and... There. <sighs> that first kiss can turn into a dinosaur if you don't get it over with. <laughs> Why'd you hide in the cellar when Jack came for me? I wasn't hiding. <laughs> what uh, what branch of the service was he in? He was 4F. He wanted to go, but he's almost blind without his glasses. I, uh, I'm a little busy not working. I'm sorry. Is your nose out of joint, too? No. Well, that's a relief. So what'd you think of Jack? Well, he's kind of handsome, and he seems really nice. Yeah. How would you feel if I went out with him again? Gee, why are you asking me? Well, I don't want you to be hurt because of Daddy. Jack's really nice, and I think he likes me a lot. So come on, Mom. Did he kiss? Is that all you care about? It's none of your beeswax. Good night, precious. Good night. Hey, Mom? Yeah? Thanks for asking me. Day for a picnic. Well, I'm just sorry your dad's too busy to come along. Lucky for you, I wasn't too busy. <laughs> <laughs>
Or Judge, look at this. Oh, <laughs> they've already tried and failed with that one. <laughs> I'm not spending the whole evening in the cellar again. Mm. Hell with it. Bye, Mom. Bye, See you tonight, Grandma. Dad, we've got to talk. Done, Judge. I'm gonna shoot you if this isn't damn good. It's great. Beckett, as Archbishop of Canterbury, often asserted his independence from the king. Once a certain monk stood accused of the murder of a follower of one of the king's barons. King Henry demanded that the monk be tried in his courts, but Beckett refused, claiming the crime should be dealt with by the, by the uh, church. Now, let me just tell it to you. The monk hid in his monastery. This baron destroyed the monastery looking for him before he found him. Beckett told the king he had to pay for the damages. King told Beckett to go to hell. So Beckett had him tried in absentia in front of a tribunal of bishops. They found him guilty, and they made him pay a fine. King Henry paid a fine because he wanted Beckett to excommunicate some joker that he didn't like in the church. But it doesn't alter the fact that the king paid. And sovereign immunity was broken. Exactly. All this time I was thinking of civil law when this is under the realm of church law. That counts, doesn't it, Judge? You're damn right it does, if there's a record of it in Glasscock. If it's here, we've got it's a citation we can use in court. We? You. Well, I'll be damned. Here it is. I'll guarantee you one thing. The Attorney General himself is going to show up for this. Because if we get us the right judge, I mean, if you get the right judge, someone who appreciates history, Harvey Gold, he'd be your man, and I'm just the fellow who can arrange to get him. Then maybe they'll let you take on the king. Judge, if you want to say let us take on the king, it's okay with me. Well, I'll tell you something. You hurt my feelings when you said I didn't care about the people in that asylum. But so long as you won't resign, I guess the whole firm ought to show up in court. By the way, do we have a case? Hoping you wouldn't ask that. Oye, oye, all rise. Maryland Circuit Court for Anne Arundel County is now in session. The Honorable Judge Harvey Gold presiding. Give me the date of that site, please, Mr. Cobb. May 5th, 1159, Your Honor. Oh, Glasscock's systematic interpretation of English canon law. Hmm. Yes, sir. Judge Bell and I have prepared a brief that expands the particulars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Beckett? What that says, Your Honor, is that Henry II got held accountable for not protecting his subjects from himself. We uh, are asking Your Honor to apply the same standards to the state of Maryland. With all due respect, Your Honor, it, it is well known that you love obscure precedent. But this citation is absurd. Luckily, Mr. Attorney General, that is for me to decide, not you. Hmm? Now, I'm going to retire and study this brief. Court is in recess.
Judge Gold is ready. Gentlemen, this is interesting. I'm going to hear this case. Yeah! First thing we've got to do in the trial is put a human face on an absent plaintiff. Even if we can do it, proving those people drove her crazy is going to be real sticky. They're not stupid. And the Attorney General is a tough customer in court, believe me. Well, the only friendly witness we've got is Donald, the fellow who took me through the asylum. Some witness. They'll try to have him disqualified, so it'll be up to Judge Gold. I don't hold out much hope. Winning a legal point like we just did is real satisfying. I just hope we can use it to save that young woman's soul. so I can help our friend America. Do you think you could talk to somebody about what it's like down here? All right, forget it. Forget it, Donald. It's all right. Do you know what a business card is? Business card. Do you know how to read? All right, take this. Take it. It's got my number on it. Don't show it to anybody if you ever have to call me. Do you know how to use a phone? seen the doctors and nurses talk to them, but... One more thing. Could you take me to see our friend again? I can. Hurry. Hurry, you think catch us. Sorry, America. I promise you'll never have to see this. do is wish you luck. Mm, thanks. Dad, look at me. I have a speech I've been rehearsing for two days and you're going to listen to it. Don't make it. Sorry, but I'm going to. Dad. You know I've loved you all these years, even more than I love my own father. It was the most natural thing in the world that we came to live with you when Harry went overseas. And after he died, it was just home. We're here because you're our family, and that's who you stay with. So here goes. Jack Atkins is in love with me. I don't know if I'm in love with him yet, but I know I want to be. You have to accept it, Dad. All right, don't. Yes, you do. Do you think I didn't love Harry as much as you did? I don't know how much you loved him. I only know how much I loved him. Don't you know what you're doing? For God's sake, you're killing him for me all over again. Oh, Dad, that hurts. That just hurts me so much. I'm 
sorry to do this to you, Donald, but it's the only way we can help America. Donald, don't you want to see what's out here? All these cars and people. Donald, too? What kind of name is that? Well, he was the second Donald in the boys' wing when he got there, Your Honor. Donald, the reason that you had to come here is because if you testify in the trial, this is where you'll have to do it. Do you understand that? He's just frightened you, right? Donald. Donald, tell the judge about the cold animals. Tell the judge about the baths, Donald. Donald, please, don't you want to help America? What do you want me to do? I cannot let you put this man on the stand. It's all right, Donald. It's all right. It's all right. I first met Marika Popolis when she came from Greece in 1937. She was 17 years old. There was an arranged marriage. Uh, they still do that sometimes. Her husband died, and uh, my wife and I, we took her in. She worked in my restaurant for nine years. What did she look like? Objection. Ordinarily, Your Honor, the plaintiff in a civil action would be sitting in the courtroom. I think the jury ought to know who's bringing suit here. Oh, please. No, no. I'll permit it. Go ahead, please. Well, I, I bring picture here. She was 12. Objection. What the plaintiff looked like at 12 is irrelevant and frivolous. Oh, very well, then. We have a more recent photograph. Absolutely not, Your Honor. Why? What you objected to was the age of that photograph. You opened up this can of worms for yourself, Mr. Attorney General. I will admit the second photograph. And, uh, Mr. Cobb, you've made as much of a point on this as I'll allow. Hmm? You can step down, Mr. Vavokas. And we're in recess for lunch. Mr. Cobb. I'm Jack Atkinson. Can I talk to you, please? Go ahead. I wish I could make it so you don't hate me, but I've been looking for a girl like Billy all my life, and now that I found her, I'm, I've got to fight for her. So now I know that I can never appreciate what you went through in losing your son. No, you can. Okay, but, but just think about this. It wasn't anybody's fault, and... Even though you don't care about me, don't you think Billy deserves a chance to be happy? Yes, I do. Dr. Halloway, uh, this document contains testimony that you gave before the State Senate Finance Committee last February. On page two, you state, in 1946, Walnut Hill gave treatment second to none to 330 inmates. Is that true, sir? Yes. And on page six, Walnut Hill is a spotless facility where kindness and mercy are the watchwords. Do you stand by those words, sir? Your Honor, are we going to go line by line through this report? I'm just trying to find out if it's true and accurate. Ye gods. Your Honor, the state will gladly stipulate to that. Anything to save time, Your Honor. 
I'll submit this report, Your Honor, as an exhibit of the plaintiffs. Accepted. Dr. Holloway, if I were a person who needed mental health care and I read that report, which the state of Maryland just stipulated contains the unvarnished truth, I guess I would feel pretty wonderful about going out there, wouldn't I? You might, yes. And, Lord forbid, if your mother needed mental health care, you as a loving son wouldn't hesitate for a second to send her out there, would you? Objection. I withdraw the question, Your Honor. Dr. Holloway, do you have a patient at your facility named Marika Pupulis? That's correct. She committed herself, did she not, on, uh, on uh, December 28th, 1946? Did she not? That's correct. Did you diagnose her when she came, or did someone else? I did. And uh, could she talk, uh, read, write, uh, sign her name? Yes. So what was your diagnosis? That she was severely depressed. You uh, discussed this with Dr. Obenland. He's listed here as the, as the admitting physician. On the 28th, he prescribed treatment at that time. Uh, he did this personally? Yes. I have no more questions. Well, they stipulated to a bundle of lies. Good work. Now all you've got to do is prove their lies. Thanks for the encouragement. Nice to see your face, Squirt. Nice to see yours too, Grandpa. <laughs> How's your mom? She's all right. Sit down. Sit down. Hmm. You got a little apartment, huh? Yes. Oh, Grandpa, I want to come back and live with you. I would like that, too. I know why you're sad. You do? Remember when we went fishing after Daddy died and I caught the rainbow trout and you made me throw him back? You said we'd always remember his colors. When I miss Daddy, I think about what you said and I remember it. Everything about him I can. And I look at all the pictures we have of him, every one, over and over. I'm never going to forget him, Grandpa. Never in my whole life. Me neither. Well, then, don't you think Mom's always going to remember him, too? Here, Grandpa. I bought a book with a page for every day of the year. It's for you. I wrote in all the pages, see? Remember Nancy. I could never forget you, Nancy. Never in a million years. Thanks, sweetheart. Tell me, Dr. Obenlin, how many sessions of psychoanalysis does it take to cure somebody who's psychotically depressed? Couldn't possibly say. One treatment? Hardly. Uh, a hundred? Sometimes. Hmm. Now, according to Marika Pupulis' hospital records, you had 28 sessions of psychotherapy with her. Is that correct? Yes, if that's what it says, yes. 
And uh, the records also state that you prescribed 12 insulin shock treatments, eight electroconvulsive shock treatments. Is that also true? Yes. So you gave up on the psychotherapy? Yes, she uh, deteriorated from a depressed state into psychosis. Doctor, at the psychotherapy sessions, what is it that you do anyway? Well, I elicit uh, memories and feelings of childhood, uh, looking for areas I can delve into more deeply. Tell us about the time your mother or your father beat you, that sort of thing. <laughs> it's hardly that obvious. Now, there are also tests, word association, picture association, that sort of thing. Getting at the root of psychotic or neurotic behavior is a very complex process. Ah. So that's pretty much what you did with Marika Pupulis. Yes. How much do you make out there, Doctor? I mean, uh, do you get a salary from the state, or do you, they pay you by the consultation? Uh, I, I get paid a, a flat fee, $27 a month per patient. $27 a month per patient you cure? Uh, no. Well, then what, sir? For a patient I treat. Twenty-seven dollars a month doesn't seem like very much unless you had fifty patients out there. Do you have that many? It's possible. Fifty patients times twenty-seven dollars a month. That's thirteen hundred and fifty dollars a month. You treat them all? Yes, I treat them all. You've published some pretty successful books, have you not, Doctor? Yes, I have. Based on case studies of the hopelessly insane? Well, it's in a general sense. Isn't it true that the source material for these books are the patients you treat at Walnut Hill? Yes, and I deeply resent the implication. Oh. Then you'll be happy to know I have no more questions. Thank you, Doctor. Your Honor, I may need to recall this witness. Dr. Friedman, have you had any occasion in your own practice to administer electric shock treatments? Hundreds of times. You examined Marika Papoulis on July 15th, didn't you? That's correct. When you're examining a patient, is there any way you can tell if she's recently had an electric shock treatment? A patient undergoing electroshock experiences violent convulsions. There is bruising, either from the convulsions themselves or from the restraints used to control the patient. Doctor, I'm going to show you a page from the Walnut Hill Hospital medical file on America Papoulis. Would you tell me what's indicated right there? That she was administered electroconvulsive shock at 11 a.m. on July 15, 1947. Hmm. Same day you examined her? Yes. I saw her around 2 p.m. Did she show any signs of bruising? None whatsoever. Does that suggest any conclusion to you, doctor? Because I can tell you it's suggesting one to this jury. Yes, that Marika Papoulis received no shock treatment on the morning of July 15th. Your witness, Dr. Friedman. We're talking about one small discrepancy. Isn't it just possible that a mistake could have been made in the records? Sure. And pigs have wings. <laughs> the jury will absolutely disregard the witness's last remark. I have no further questions. You may step down, doctor. Your Honor, my client needs to subpoena some records. Dr. Omenland, do you recognize this? Uh, that appears to be my uh, appointment book. One from your office? Yes. You're a very busy man. An appointment every hour, on the hour, five days a week. You keep them all? Of course. Then I'll uh, ask you about some of these entries. Now, we'll use initials for purposes of confidentiality. Okay. December 31st, 
You had a different patient every hour from 9 o'clock in the morning until 5.30 in the afternoon with a half hour off for lunch. Is that correct? If that's what it says. That's what it says. Here we have the hospital records. December the 31st. You had one of your 28 psychotherapy sessions with Marika Pupulis at Walnut Hill at 11 a.m. Where were you, doctor? At Walnut Hill, treating Marika Pupulis, or at your office, treating DL? What about January the 3rd? Were you at Walnut Hill treating Marika Pupulis, or were you at your office treating DS? Well, please tell us, doctor. Please tell us. I was in my office. All right. So you weren't treating Marika Pupulis at Walnut Hill on the 31st of December, and you were not treating her at Walnut Hill on the 3rd of uh, January. Is that right? That's right. Well, did you ever treat her on any of those other 28 psychotherapy sessions? No. You didn't delve into her past, lead her through a complete medical examination, give her a word association test? No. But the truth is, doctor, that you have never in your life set eyes on Marika Pupulis, have you? No. Oh. <laughs> But I did nothing wrong. I did not falsify those hospital records. No, but you lied about them. Thank you very much, Doctor. Your Honor, I'm finished with this witness. Well, we proved they didn't help her, but all they got to do is promise to be good boys from now on. I don't think we'll win the suit without proving they hurt her. Damn, Donald's the only one on our side who knows enough to hurt them. Oh, well. Want to flip a coin to see who sums up tomorrow? You can do the honors, Judge. Thanks. I don't mind if I do. in with the people with the black eyes, Donald. Hey, Donald! Herman, come. Are you inside the phone? What? Who's this? It's Donald, too. Holy Chicago. I know. Seven ways out of the hospital. But I was always afraid before. One of the ways out is, is beside the big, big chimney where they do the laundry. Can you come to the big chimney and take me away with you? I, uh, 
I want to help Merrick before they cut my brain. I'll be there. Donald, tell us about when you went to see Judge Gold before. I was bad before. I was afraid. Why? Dr. Holloway said if I talked to you, they would hurt America. Well, why did you change your mind about talking now? Because Dr. Holloway's going to cut my brain. People with the black eyes did Never smile. Sometimes the doctor makes a mistake and they can't talk. Not ever. Stanley told me that's what what would happen to me. Stanley is the big attendant who was with him when he was in your chambers before, Your Honor. So I ran away. I know seven ways out of the hospital. I cut outside the fence to the place by the big chimney. Harmon Cobb was there. We drove to his house in a car. I was never in a house before. Now I've been in two houses. <laughs> I ran away so I could tell about America before Dr. Holloway cuts my brain and I can't talk anymore. What do you mean, the people with the black eyes? Prefrontal lobotomy patients. Dr. Friedman says they exhibit post-operative contusions around the eyes. Shiners. The eyes, that's where they go in. They call it ice pick surgery. Judith Priest. All right. Put him on the stand. Donald... Why are you at Walnut Hill? I'm a fever-minded child. How long have you been there? Since I was three years old. Have you ever been to school? No. But I know how to read and write. Who taught you? William Five. His mother taught him. Before this happened, were you ever outside the grounds of the hospital? No. What do you do at the hospital, Donald? I have a job. I'm an orderly. I, I help move people and I clean their messes. Or do you get paid for this work? Do you get money? Do they give you money? I don't know what that is. I... They give me food and a place to sleep. And where is that, the place to sleep? We sleep in the basement of the Diva building. It's one there. Who's we? The 23 of us there. Tw 23. Children like me. Mm. How old are you, Donald? 54 years old. Uh, you, are you the oldest child? No, Billy one is 63 years old. Mm. Where are you going, Harman? Oh, I'll be right back. I'm just going to get a picture here. Here, Donald. Who is this lady? That's my friend. Marika is her name. Marika. How often do you see her? Every day. I'm the orderly for the basement of the uh, Lloyd building. Uh, I bring food and I clean there. Is that where she lives? Yes. What kind of a room does she have? Oh, Ben. Uh, it's, it's not a coal bin anymore. They took the coal out and put a wire door and three little rooms, and she's in the second room. What does she use for toilet? A pail. What does she sleep on? Mattress. Does she ever leave the room? Once a week, when I clean it with the hose. Where do they take her when you do this? To the washtubs over by the 
uh, furnace to give her back. Does a doctor ever come to the hospital to visit America? No. No. A nurse? No. Why, why do they keep her in the coal bin? She was bad. Your Honor, may I approach the bench? $25,000 actual damages, 100,000 punitive damages, and we want Merrick and Papoulis treated at state expense in the Friedman Clinic. Half on the damage. No, sir. Before you get to dickering too hard, Mr. Attorney General, let me tell you how I've decided to rule on the question of sovereign immunity. It's clear to me, based on the facts in the case, that the state ought to be liable for damages done to people trusting in its care. Now, I may be overturned on appeal, but... Uh, and again, I might not be. I don't want to run the risk of setting a precedent that will open the floodgates to 10,000 lawsuits like this one. Everybody who thinks the state has done him an injustice will hire a lawyer who will be bankrupt. I'll give you the full amount. Good. The question of sovereign immunity is moot for the moment. In the meantime, I'll put Donald II under protective custody. Well, let's not keep the jury waiting. Merrick Hippopoulos is getting out of purgatory. And the wonderful thing is that maybe before long the place won't be purgatory anymore. Judge Bell, is this the most satisfying case you've ever tried? I didn't try it. This fellow here tried it. Harmon Cobb. Did a hell of a job, too. Showed more grit than any other lawyer I've ever met, except one. And that was Clarence Darrell. Walk it up, Well, I told you not to take this case. Now you're going to be famous and have a swelled head and you want more money. Wouldn't know what to do with it, Judge. Thanks for your help. Did a pretty good job yourself. I really did know Clarence Darrow, you know. He was the worst dressed lawyer I ever set eyes on until I met you. <laughs> Welcome to Baltimore. <laughs> you. <laughs> 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 You're invited to dinner. I am. Bring Billy and Nancy, but don't tell Billy where you're taking her or she won't come. Okay. Can you make it tonight? Absolutely. Do you fish? Sounds delicious. No, no. Do you fish? Oh, once in a while, but, you know, I'm, I'm not really avid about it. <laughs> well, you better get avid about it. It's a required activity in our family. I see you to come. Who's your sourpuss girlfriend? Face looks familiar. Soup's on. Let's go.
That's when they folded. The judge was thrilled with his victory over the attorney general. You should have seen him that night. Nick Vovokas had a big party. The judge drank too much ouzo. <laughs> I'm real proud of you, Dad. Thank you. Coming from you, that means a lot. Squirt, I know you're a guest, but uh, will you do the dishes? Sure. You can help clear and dry. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Tell me. Good meal, huh, Squirt? Uh-huh. <laughs> I said a terrible thing, and I'm sorry. Of course it was nowhere near the, the truth. You see, what I've done since Harry was killed is go around kind of half alive. It's like it's still the day that telegram arrived. And I couldn't see why life had to go on. So for the love of heaven, will you please move back here and take care of me? At least until you get married, or I get married, or whichever comes sooner. Are you sure you didn't make this awful meal on purpose so I'd feel sorry for you? Never had an ulterior motive in my life. You old faker. Dad, I want to move back more than anything in the world. Jack told me about a place to go fishing. It's called Little Hunting Creek, and it's somewhere near Frederick. His dad used to fish there. It's got native brook trout in it, Bob. Brook trout? Yeah. Come in the kitchen. You dry. I want to talk to Jack. Remember that? Yes. My friend. What a beautiful face. You see, didn't I tell you? She has sunshine in her smile. <laughs> Bring her over here. She doesn't remember a thing about Walnut Hill. She just has a vague notion about Donald and about you. The resilience of the human spirit is an amazing thing sometimes. Thomas! Hey, Donald. How are you? I have my own room with books and a radio. I've been to the zoo and seen the animals. I've seen the ocean. <laughs> It's good, Donald. <laughs> Makes me real happy. I'm proud of you. Thank God, huh, man? Hello. Hello! America! Oh, hello! Oh, oh these are your friends? Nice thing to see. Donald's discovering the world. So am I. 